Rooted in Curry Tuck, a journey back through growing up and in Curry Tuck County, North Carolina. Produced by the Curry Tuck County Center of North Carolina Cooperative Extension. I am Cameron Lowe, the County Extension Director, and here with me today, fresh off maternity leave. I'm Olivia Patchell, and I'm the Family and Consumer Science Extension Agent. Olivia, it is great to have you here with us today. I'm so glad you're back in the office, and I can't wait to engage you in more of these podcasts. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. I can't wait to help with the podcast. Awesome. Awesome. Well, in today's episode of Rooted in Curry Tech, we'll hear from Barbara Snowden, a former Curry Tech history teacher and local historian. And then later in the podcast, we'll offer some training on cold hardiness zones and native plants. But for now, let's step back in time for a segment we like to call From the Archives. Olivia, I was perusing some of the reports from 1932 and I came across this really neat story uh, that references some of what Miss Snowden was talking about by the home demonstration agent from that year. Do you remember who that was? No, no. In 1932, my mom was not even born. Yeah, right. 30 years from being born, actually. So there you go. So there you go. So, so safe to say you have no recollection of that era. No. But I bet when I tell you the name, you'll know who she is. So the home demonstration agent in 1932 was a woman by the name of Miss Virginia Edwards. Oh, yeah. Miss Virginia Edwards, like the Virginia Edwards Clubs, which later or now we call the Extension and Community Association Clubs. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, she was so important here in Curry Tech that they named clubs after her. Mm -hmm. She actually is on pictures in the walls here at the Extension office as well. Um, so she was the home demonstration agent that year. Uh, accompanying her on the staff was Mr. Luke Powell, who was our agriculture agent at that time. Um, and this is part of the report that they had submitted to the state. Uh, during that year. So funny, they had to do reports just like we do. <laughs> yeah, we still have to do those state and federal level reports, mm -hmm. and, and that's what they did then. But man, did they create some neat records when they did that stuff. wonder what they'll say when they look back on our records. I don't know, but we need to make sure that they're archived <laughs> and, and out there so that folks can actually see them and access them. Um, so let me just read an excerpt from this report because it does reference uh, two individuals that Miss Barbara talked about in her interview. So here we go. Ms. Ms. Edwards writes, our 1932 marketing project began in a Christmas gift. We have in our county two philanthropists who have, in a way, adopted Curry Tuck County. They see that our children have the best of schools, that our teachers have excellent teacherages in which to live, that our farmers have proper backing in a time of need, and that our women have aid when aid is needed. For a long time, Curry Tech County had wanted to show its appreciation to Mr. and Mrs. Joseph P. Knapp for their kindness, but to express such appreciation in an appropriate way was a difficult task. Mr. Dudley Bagley, one of our leading citizens, conceived a wonderful idea. Why not send a chest of canned goods to Mr. and Mrs. Knapp? Each woman would be allowed to give only one jar, which should be labeled with name of product and the canner's name without an address. The chests, for there had to be two to hold the products, were made by an Elizabeth City cabinet maker and paid for by the Curry Tuck Mutual Exchange, which was a cooperative which Mr. Knapp had helped organize in a time of distress for Curry Tuck farmers. The agent, Miss Virginia Edwards, sent letters to club presidents asking for jars of canned goods. Now that club presidents that she's referring to there were, they were extension homemaker clubs, um, Home demonstration clubs, I yep. think they were mm -hmm. called during that time. And and do we have those today? Yeah. So we still have several extension and community association clubs today. Yeah. So we have updated the name yep. <laughs> um, to represent all women or men or whomever mm -hmm. might be involved in those organizations. Uh, so extension and community association. Um, so she sent letters to those club presidents asking for jars of canned goods. They came in so abundantly that two chests were filled and they were packed beautifully with lovely Christmas card of greeting. They were a complete surprise to the Naps. They appreciated the thought and they enjoyed the products. And I love this reference. Some were excellent, some were fair, but the thought was there just the same. <laughs> that just shows to show just because you can doesn't mean you should. That's you know? right. Not everything needs to be put in a can, right? Oh, mercy. Um, so Mr. Knapp, who was a resident of New York, says Mr. Knapp came back from New York a month or so later. 
and said, and I quote, why couldn't Curry Tech women make money on their products, end quote. So the plans were begun. That sounds like us. Yeah. Why can't we just make a podcast? That's right. Let's just try something. So I like Mr. Knapp's spirit there. Um, and so actually, um, they began to make some general plans for how the women could make money from their efforts. Um, and Mr. Edwards continues by writing, the exchange would cooperate with women just as it had with their husbands, buying jars, sugar, and vinegar and fruits, which had to be bought outside the county. The women would make their products accordingly, using definitely worked up recipes and amounts in clean kitchens. The products would be marketed through the exchange and each woman paid for their products after all had been sold. And so they go on through an exceptional level of detail about, um, you know, the board of directors that they created for this exchange, they, how they're going to market the products, how they are going to provide for quality control. Um, they even had uh, budgets and, and, oh my goodness, they made, looks like $2,529. Um, in the, the first year wow. of the exchange, which, you know, this is coming out of the Depression. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's awesome. Um, granted, it was split among multiple families, but that's that's really pretty good money. And it sounds just like some of the things that we do today with the acidified schools that come out of the university to help people um, can and shared kitchens that Absolutely. are inspected by the health inspector that people can use if they want to market their products at the farmer's market. Absolutely. So, yeah, they talk about um, they did a class to make sure that, that the women understood how to can safely, what they were going to have to do, how to market their product, those kinds of things that were, were taught by the extension agent, mm -hmm. which you still do today. Yeah, we do um, canning classes every year. Yeah, to make sure things are safe and sanitary, healthy, mm -hmm. those types of things. Um, they even list out the recipes that they did, although there's a little note in here that says our recipes are kept in the county since they are our means of making money. In okay. other words, Hold those sure. secrets safe. That's all right. <laughs> so I haven't come across the recipes yet, but if I do, we may or may not publish them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they even had in the report, they had a copy of the label um, that was put on the jars that How were neat. sold at the exchange. So if you're watching the video version of this podcast, we'll, we'll throw up an image of that label. Um, and there was a... Uh, Miss West that actually won the contest for creating that label and hopefully I can find her name here very quickly as I shuffle through the paperwork. Uh, yes, Mrs. Rupert E. West of Moyoc was the um, the person who made the winning label that went on all the jars and then Mr. Knapp gave a $10 award to Miss Miss West for winning the contest. So. Just kind of a neat story that, mm -hmm. you know, that really um, shares the kinds of things that's done in Extension. We take an idea and we put some education behind it and we really try to um, help folks make the best of yep. their situation. I really love it. Empowering women to make some of their own money, even back in the 30s, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And, and still what we do today. Mm -hmm. We empower people. We try to provide solutions. Um, and certainly we don't want to do all the things for people, but we do want to teach people. Mm -hmm. how to do things to improve their own situations. So cool story, cool report. Definitely. Looks back at some of the things that Ms. Barbara is going to talk about here in just a few minutes um, concerning Mr. Bagley and Mr. Knapp. Um, and so I just thought that was a neat, neat fun share for us to look at today as we jump into the podcast. Definitely. Thanks for sharing it with us. Yeah, absolutely. Olivia, this is fun. I can't wait to have you on here again. Mm -hmm. I'm so, so glad you're back. Uh, but for now, that is it for From the Archives. <laughs> Up next, we'll meet our guest. I am very excited today to be doing some interviews with our locals in Currituck. And um, we have uh, our first person here to share some stories with us. And can you tell us your name and how long you've lived in Currituck? Okay, my name is Barbara Snowden and I've been in Currituck since 1967. I came down here to teach history and uh, ended up marrying my husband and have been here ever since. I know when you first arrived here, Currituck was very different. Think about back in 1967 when you first came here, what was your impression of Currituck back then? What did you remember seeing? Well, the main thing, it was a very rural county. In fact, I told, I'm from Mecklenburg County, and so I told people back home that I figured I was in a place that was about uh, 50 years 
behind Mecklenburg in terms because I saw cows and I saw fields and people were farming was the most important thing that went on. The other thing was people driving to Norfolk to work in the Ford plant. That was the major uh, employer if you were going to be employed not here in Currytown. Um, I taught at Knapp High School. Uh, that was the, the school. One of the things that I remember um, is something that we're still fighting. There was definitely a divide between the northern end of the county and the southern end of the county. And when they came together at Knapp, that was the first time a lot of them had mingled in many ways. So it provided some interesting um, dynamics in the, in the classroom. Plus then you throw in Knotts Island. Knotts Island at one time, their students went to school in Virginia and now they had to go over all the way across the ferry and then to Knapp School. So at that point, all, all the areas came to Knapp for the one high school. Right, there was one high school in the county. And as there is today, but it's a little bit different than the rest yeah. of the county. That's true yeah, for the other schools. Had, we only had three elementary schools, Moyot, Griggs, and Knotts Island. So you've raised children here? and I've raised children. I have a daughter, and uh, she graduated from Currituck County High School and is uh, now the... Uh, She's the uh, head trainer at Davidson College and assistant athletic director, and she got that start. I, I tell people that I gave them a ballerina because she was very good at ballet, and she turned into a jock playing a track and tennis and, uh, yep. and basketball. And that's very different than ballet, but yes. it's very athletic. Well, that's awesome. We have a good sports program around here. We do. Yeah. Curry Tech has always had good sports. And, but the other thing is Curry Tech has always been known for their academics also. Right. Um, we always had a good academic program. And one of the things that I thought was very unique about Curry Tech is they let the hey, teachers you teach. About the um, I you know did what I did no in my classroom. They I followed the guidelines, but yet they allowed me to, to teach. They even allowed me to develop a course that I'm very proud of, which was Curry Tech History. So I had a year-long Curry Tech History class. That is awesome. And uh, I know that some of us have gone through that program, and I remember um, that in high school as well. So when you think about Curry Tech today, though, what are some of the things that you think that have are the biggest accomplishments? Because you've been here for a good long time, and you know a lot of our history. So There are a lot of accomplishments. Uh, when I look at Curry Tech today, I see all those houses. Um, even as far back as the 1970s, we were included in the metropolitan area as a bedroom community for Norfolk, Virginia, and we still are. Um, that worries me some because I think we're losing some of our um, uniqueness, and I don't want us to lose that. Um, we need to remember that Currituck was is one of the first counties in North Carolina. Uh, we've been around for over 350 some years and uh, we've always been very outstanding in our history and what we've had but when you see the houses that are going down and no longer being kept up and uh, when you find out things that people have forgotten it, uh, well, it's worrisome. I, I agree the history is, is something that we need to cherish and hold on to. A couple things you need to real, we need to think about is that one of the things that Curry Tuck has never succeeded in is working together both north and south. Uh, now it's more divided because the Moyock area goes to Virginia, the Shawbury area goes to Elizabeth City, the lower end of the county goes to the beach, and then you have the Outer Banks and you have Knotts Island going into Norfolk too. So we have got to, as a community, bridge all of those and come together. And we've done that in the past. Uh, I think the fact that everybody worked to get a ferry to Knotts Island in the 1950s so that the school children from Knotts Island could come over here, I think that was a major accomplishment and something that very few people have. It's something we still have to fight for right. today. Right, to, to, to keep it going. The other thing that I think uh, we need to realize is that we need to record these histories because some things disappear. I mean, what was it like farming during the Depression? I don't know. So do we have do we have that down on paper so we know what it was like? Uh, we also need to re remember that there are people who have always 
worked for the good of the whole county. Uh, Dudley Bagley in Moyoc, he helped organize the Historical Society. He was a, a he developed seeds. In fact, one of the things that I would love to find, there's a canna lily called Carolina that he developed here in Currituck. And I want to know what color it is. Oh, and I have, no, I have no idea. Right. And I'm sure we have some specialized uh, plants here for grains and things like that too. Yes. And the other thing is that Currituck is so unique in the fact that we are a transition area. We're as far to the north as some plants grow but we're as far uh, to the south as some plants grow. So curry tuck is a mixture of all of that. And that needs to be recorded. We don't need to go out to the uh, nursery and buy things that, that do well somewhere else when we have all of these things here that are unique to curry tuck County. Yeah, indigenous vegetation, yes. definitely. Very good, that's a good term for it. I, I didn't know that term. Uh, the other thing you need to be talking about, the schools, you need to, and athletics, you need to look at the boys' basketball team became state champions. The girls' softball team were state champions. So, uh, wrestling, we've had state champions. So Curry Tech has always produced the kind of students who can go to the top and can do things. And all you have to do is look at the uh, look at the uh, scholarships that Curry Tech County students win. Now we have a step up in the fact that Ms. the Knapp Foundation seems to help us every year by giving us special funds and Mr. Knapp's one of those special people that we always need to talk about and remember and he would we sometimes forget he was an outsider who came in and we have a lot of people who've moved into this county who are giving us their talents. When people come here they bring with them the things that are special and unique to them as well and we do have a, a, a different a, a population that's changing yeah. and um, wanting those people to be a part of Curry Tuck and, and feel that it's their place and not just, like you said, a place to get away from work, right. but really their home. Right. And so, what are we? What? Are, what is the problem that we've seen right, all through it history? Is that division? Is what is the right problem today? The that division. The not only the division geographically, the but also. The and division that we have, have uh, from people who think they're you you know, natives and ones who are not. Uh, my husband told me I'd be in trouble when people start thinking I was a native because I'm not. It's a, it's an interesting perspective to be. Um, well, you've been here for a very long time. It's hard to say that you're not a native, but to have that perspective from a, a, from somewhere else, and uh, I think that is also a, that's a big part of Curry Tuck's perspective too. I mean. Um, the 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 melting pot, the bridging of right. communities and so, and people. Call it a salad. I like. I that. like that idea too. Okay. A salad. We're all individual, different yeah. have different things that we mix well together. I love and that. Uh, uh, talking about, uh, we we'll get a hey guys, plug in. In a few years, uh, we're going to have. We uh, have we're going to have uh, the. 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, which also took place here in Curita. A lot of people don't know about the Liberty Pole, which a uh, flag was raised to celebrate the Declaration of Independence. You know, back in 1776, we have, we have uh, a slave by the name of John Jasper White, who actually captured, was captured, and then he recaptured the ship back from the British. And he was, he was uh, acknowledged with the Continental Congress. Uh, so you have all these things that we need to make sure are still on the forefront of what we're doing today. I agree. I, I love listening to you. It is just, I know you're just a wealth of information and I'm, I'm always excited to hear anything and everything you have to share because you just know so much and it's your passion as well. So um, I, I did not know that about the American Revolution part. So my my students, I teach over at Not Silent. My students would definitely are definitely more into the Revolutionary War this year than I have ever seen. And I don't know if that's the the politics and the and the things that are going on in our nation. And they're just aware and they're trying to know more. But even at an elementary level, I've had more students as a librarian come and ask for things of a historical nature than I ever have in the 10 years that I've been the librarian over there. So I'm like, 
something's changing in our young people too and that's important that we hold on to these stories for them for sure well part of it is the fact that people are using the Declaration of Independence and our, our Constitution but they're making shall I say erroneous statements about them and so the, it's smart it's, it's smart for the kids to learn themselves so they know what it actually does really say. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for so much. So that was Barbara Snowden, former Curry Tech history teacher and local historian. Up next, we'll have your training for today. So here with me for our training for today, uh, the famous Adam Fermella. <laughs> Hopefully positively famous. Yes, absolutely positively famous. Everybody's seen you before, Adam, because you've been doing the podcast with me for since we started. Yeah. So uh, good to have you back on at the end of this podcast to do our training for today. Yeah, I'm excited. Oh, yeah, this is fun. I'm glad we've kind of reformatted some things and, and getting it getting it down to a science. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. it's always good to evolve. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in her interview, one of the things Ms. Barber referenced was the uniqueness of the Curry Tech environment for growing things that are well suited to our area. So in our training for today, I thought we'd took, take a look at um, hardiness zones and maybe talk about some native plants for a little bit. Um, so let's start with planting zones. What is that? What are we? What does it mean? So hardiness zones are kind of a range that the USDA decides is usually about a 10 degree um, between say a one and a two. And that's the difference between how cold that plant in that area can tolerate. So for us, we're in a eight, um, which is pretty warm. Um, now it's going to change and it varies from year to year because it's based off of historical data. So they're taking climate data from, I think, um, when I was reading, they did it from like the seventies to 2012. Gotcha. So about 30 years, 40 years. Well, as you add these new years that we're getting, we're getting a little bit warmer every year. So those zones are going to shift a little bit. Um, the difference between something like an A and a B is going to be a 5 temperature. So for us, it's maybe 10 degrees Fahrenheit to 15. That's going to be the coldest, really, that most plants are going to get now. We don't get a lot of days that are much colder than that. Yeah. Um, and she mentioned that we're kind of in a unique area. Mm -hmm. um, part of that has to do with our water. So we're really close to the Atlantic Ocean. We're touching the Atlantic Ocean, right. depending on where you're at in the county. Uh, and the sound and uh, all the rivers and everything like that it helps to keep some warmer temperatures in. But as you go further south in the county, too, you start to transition into another hardiness zone. So we have kind of a unique location where we can grow things like citrus plants. Some some folks are growing some citrus plants. I've yeah. seen folks bring in lemons. It's <laughs> kind of odd. You can't really grow those anywhere uh, uh, locally. But we got, have that kind of extended growing season, too, because of that warmth. So you can push things a little bit later in the year if you're going to try to fall garden, or you can start a little bit earlier than a lot of other places because that water helps to hold some of that heat. Yeah. So that's the hardiness zones. I don't really buy into them a ton because, you know, you change from year to year. Sure. Um, and like I said, they change a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. If you're coming from somewhere like New York or New Jersey, it's going to be a lot colder up there. So their hardiness zone might be something like a three or a four. Um, so some of that, I guess, when we're talking about um, vegetable gardening and things like that, if you were in a three or a four, hardiness zone you'd have to wait a lot later to start your spring garden and you know or, or you know it would end a lot earlier than us you know we can grow our tomatoes can keep producing right on into october from yeah absolutely so you, you for us you can start transplants a lot earlier in the year because our frost date is going to be much earlier in the spring you're not going to have a frost date in may for the most part and then in the fall you can plant a little bit later if you're going to start something um, like our lettuces. Now, one thing we have to consider with our fall garden is we get really warm. I mean, it's 75 yeah. today. It's November and it's 75. Right. Well, that's going to be an issue for some of our colder plants sure. uh, because they tend to bolt. So that's another kind of factor that goes with it is we don't get a, quite as much cold and some plants need that, yeah. particularly our fruiting plants. They need what's called chill hours. and A lot of that is tied into hardiness zones. So 
it's kind of a complicated game that, you know, if you're coming from somewhere else, you kind of have to learn a new area, learn how the cold and the warmth from the water are going to affect your plants here. And I see what you say about not putting too much stock in that because really in any given year we could have a freak cold snap in, in April that's going to uh, just ruin our early spring plantings and things like that. So, you know, it really is being aware of what's going on in the climate, taking that as a general guide. Yeah, and then going on absolutely. And we get the differences between La Nina and El Nino right. is going to change when you might get a frost and that's going to affect things like peach blooms that happen or something like that. But it's also another reason why you might want to plant something that's local or native to this area. So mm -hmm. some folks maybe want to try to grow, uh, particularly fescue grass is something I get a lot of comments on is I want to grow fescue here. But we're a little bit too warm for fescue yeah. unless you're going to irrigate. So um, that's just one example. Usually I recommend some of your warmer season grasses like Bermuda or Zoysia. Um, but it even goes on to our landscape plants too. Um, you know, we, I really encourage to plant native plants. They do much better um, than something like a crepe myrtle that's not native or um, something like even a red maple. Uh, it's not necessarily a plant that's native to this area or doesn't tolerate this area quite the same. Um, so that's kind of what I steer towards natives. So what are the implications of planting those non-native plants? I mean, what types of issues do we see? So a lot of it is, um, for plants, if they're, you know, from a, a colder area, they need a particular amount of uh, cold weather sometimes, frost, um, and so they're going to be more susceptible to diseases. You know, we have high humidity here, we have warm sure. temperature, that's all going to affect them. And really any stress you get on a plant is an opportunity for a disease, a pest, or whatever to affect your plant. And that's something we see a lot here with red maple, we get a lot of gloomy scale. Mm -hmm. If you go out in the woods, there's not a lot of gloomy scale. So the right. problem is there's stressed trees and neighborhoods and parking lots. Um, and so while it is a native tree to the U.S., it doesn't do all that well in this area. Gotcha. Okay, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So from the perspective of, you know, our plants that are native to this area generally grow better in this area, have less disease and insect pressure and those types of things. So also if I'm selecting my landscape plants, you know, and I... I'm real susceptible to walking into a garden center and seeing something pretty yeah. and wanting to plant it and, and doing so. And it might last one season and then I've got to dig it up because it got too cold that year Absolutely. or whatever. And I've got to change it out. So I'm wasting a lot of money in that case. So could be even be a money saver to absolutely yeah and and really here another thing we have is hurricanes yeah. and salt water so there's some plants that don't tolerate that and that's something to consider you know you might have a plant that grows really quickly a lot of people love bradford pears it's a beautiful tree white blossoms in the spring it's green bushy but man does that thing split whenever you get a wind yeah. so and it doesn't have to be a very strong wind and either. it doesn't no <laughs> <laughs> been there done that that's for sure that yeah. is for sure um very very good information there, Adam. Anything else that we should know about natives or things that are specific to our environment that we should be careful about? Well, the big thing is, you know, if you're getting something or bringing something in from somewhere else, make sure that you're checking over that plant. Um, one thing that's kind of unique to this area is crepe myrtle bark scale. Mm -hmm. And that's something that was kind of introduced in Virginia in the Hampton Roads area. And we're starting to see a lot of it. Now, that's a plant that's not native crepe myrtles, but it has essentially been here forever. Right. Um, and so that's something, just make sure that you're looking out for those things. When you're trying to find natives, it's difficult. If you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart, you might not know if something's native or not. Maybe you see a lot of them. Uh, so just give us a call. We'll try to find that information for you. We've got a lot of resources, and we've got a flower sale, depending on when you're listening to this, in April. So could have already happened. Maybe <laughs> it is happening a couple months from now. But the focus this year is on going native. So we're planting a lot of native plants. Um, I've been starting a lot of native trees. So I've been collecting acorns yes. and all kinds of native seeds that I can find, and hopefully I'll grow some. So um, that'll be exciting. You know, that's really cool. And I, I, we started the podcast with our uh, from the archive segment and where I had looked back at some of the reports from 1932 and we started with the little um, segment there. But also in that report from 1932, since you mentioned starting the seeds, we have this account from um, Mrs. W.S. Boswood's Home Improvement. And it says, uh, Ms. Boswood and her two daughters, Sarah and Mr. Chester R. Morris, with the help of father and brother last year, fixed their home into beautiful by using native shrubs and then 
I skip down, and down here it says that Sarah uh, made a rooting ground just to the back of a barn. There's a nice, warm, well-protected place, and when any of her friends prune shrubs, Sarah takes the culls, trims, sticks them in the rooting ground. When they've taken root and grown enough, she transplants them into a garden row and later into her yard. Wow. Which, yeah, that's pretty cool. It just says she'll have shrubs to sell before long that will probably make some money for her, but... You know, we can do that too. I guess it's another source for getting native plants is, you know, propagating them ourselves. Yeah, yeah it's funny. Every year, I always used to think my dad was crazy and he'd go out and he would just collect acorns and all kinds of things and he'd shove them in our fridge <laughs> and drive my mom crazy. But <laughs> native plants are kind of hard to find at the store, but they're easy to find. They're all around us. Um, so you, sometimes you can just go out and find them, talk to somebody if it's on their land, they may be willing to give you a seed or give you a cutting of that plant. So Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great way to, you know, I, my favorite thing was go to grandma's house and take a cutting so that when grandma's not here, I still have, you know, her her famous whatever it was, fig bush or whatever, oh, yeah. that, that I've got some in my yard too. So very, very cool. So natives, cold hardiness zones. That was some good information that we got from you today, Adam. So thank you for uh, doing our training for today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we want to thank our guest again, Miss Barbara Snowden. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Rooted in Curry Tuck. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you don't miss an episode. And if you have a story to share, Connect with at Curry Tech CES on social media or give us a call at the Curry Tech Extension Center. Till next time.